Um, let's switch gears a little bit. I want to come back to your poetry, sure, sure. but I'd like to talk about poetry in general. And okay. Your view. Um, I think a lot of people are frightened of poetry. I think They've, that's true. Um, they find or embarrassed it by it. Embarrassed by or they, it, possibly. Or they say things that they make excuses about bad training in high in school. Right. They blame their teachers. They blame their wives, the culture, their husbands, whatever the case may be. They're they're apologetic about it. Or they feel and scornful of it. They're scornful, or they feel it's too difficult. In which it's not. It's, I mean. <laughs> It's, it's, it's abysmally simple. Well, doesn't it depend on the poetry? Do, do, do you feel that there is some poetry, per, perhaps even being written now, that well, you take, tends to be opaque? Well, let's just take two poets. Yeah. Let's take Billy Collins and John Ashbery. Very different poets. They're good friends. Okay. <laughs> uh, they both like each other. I mm -hmm. know them both. I've been accompanied with them. Ashbery is a very, very difficult, but not the most difficult. But difficult. But he's a difficult poet. But he's been writing, you know, since he's 20, 18 years old. So how would you tell people who want to read Ashbery, who aren't necessarily steeped in a poetical tradition, I would explain, how would you tell them to go about doing it? I would tell them to go about the same way he writes his poetry, which he, or teaches poetry. He works from his own unconscious. He does not know what's coming next. He does not make notes. That's the way he teaches. He doesn't do any preparation. He doesn't plan in advance. I'm not saying this is good, I'm not saying it's bad. His whole body, his mind, his soul, his unconscious, his psyche, whatever you want to call it, is tuned in. So that's a kind of endless preparation. So are you saying that people should relax when they read They should poetry? relax and let it, come, let, let it fall where it may. And would you say that about your own poetry? In the way I would say I'm closer, I'm ironically, I seem closer to Billy, and Billy's a very dear friend of mine. Yeah. But I think I'm closer to Ashbury. Yeah. But we're in a good in a good age of oral poetry now, albeit at the same time there are a lot of young poets who get PhDs, which was a straight would have been a strange thing for a poet to do 50 or 60 years ago, and are driven by the things that an English teacher, bless him or her, might be driven by theory and such and accommodates the poetry to that. And the poetry might then reflect a complication, it'd be too intellectual, be too complex referentially, or such. Poetry to me is a simple, it appears to be a simple object, if I can call it an object. Yeah. The, the source of it might be very complex, and I, I, I don't think the poet can learn at least talk about his sources. Well, he can try. Well, I was going to ask you, actually, when, when, you, when you write a poem. Can um, you imagine Emily Dixon trying to explain her poems? No, but I wish I did have her here to ask. Well, and I, I have you. So I'll ask you, what, what, is there any consistent strain behind what launches you into a poem? I mean, is it an image? I start, I generally start with words themselves a group of words, and it comes to me, and when those words come to me, they're either false, it's either the devil or an angel playing, playing with me. And my main job is to know when it's a false start or a true start. And I write, by the way, I have books full of, I reject more poems than I say. And I always am almost done before I throw, before I discovered the poem came from a devil, not from an angel. So you don't really know until I really you're... don't know until. Do the you end. ever look at a published poem and say, "Boy, that yes, should I not do. have gone in"? That's why yeah. I, I have a selected poems. Well, this is a selected. Well, I wanted to ask you but about I, I, that. I have, if I get yeah. a collected, it would be a thousand poems, and these are only poems that I wrote. So not there's a, that I didn't a tremendous write. amount of pruning that goes on. These in this anthology, there are three poems that I wanted to ask you about. That okay. get, they get anthologized. These are great this uh, book you're talking about is this time. Yes. Uh, it's new this and, new time. And selected new poems. and selected poems and it won it, the National Book Award. Um, and I wonder if you would talk to us a little bit about well three poems in this group in this collection are anthologized a great mm -hmm. deal. Um, Lucky Life, right. The Dancing, and Behaving Like a Jew. They seem okay. to recur in anthologies. And I wonder what you think about that. Do these three poems reflect you 
at your core as a poet, or do you think it's just for whatever reason that these poems seem to get picked up again and again? I would opt for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. However, more and more I've come to accept those poems. I, I rejected the idea. I, when people say to, used to say to me, would you read Lucky Life? I said, I don't want to read Lucky Life. Right, I've written 500 poems. But I, I actually have come back to that. And I think it's a very good and interesting poem. Would you read Maybe that Maybe not poem? the best poem in the book. Which of the three would you, or perhaps another poem? Well, that when you, you would... said the dancing. And behaving like Let me read you. the dancing. OK. May I do that? Yes, I would love to have you. Here it is. Now, I this, just is, opened... this, is this is what is called a Holocaust poem, or can, can be, among other things, <laughs> That, but I didn't write it. I didn't set off to write a poem about, you know, the Holocaust. I was, I had just gone to Iowa City in 1981 to teach there. I thought I, I had a nice salary, professor, instant tenure, but I still behaved like a graduate student. I went into a shop, bought an old toaster, tried to see if the toaster worked, put a piece of bread in and such. And, while I was there, I discovered an old radio, a Philco. I don't know if that brand is still available. And you put a record in it, it ate a record up and played music. It was like, just like the one I had in my house. And that generated the poem. But the poem ended up an altogether different thing. It ended up, much to my surprise, something altogether different. And the poem goes like this. In all these rotten shops, in all this broken furniture and wrinkled ties and baseball trophies and coffee pots, I have never seen a post-war Philco with the automatic eye, nor heard Ravel's Bolero the way I did in 1945 in that tiny living room on Beechwood Boulevard, nor danced as I did then, my knives all flashing, my hair all streaming, my mother red with laughter, my father cupping his left hand under his armpit, doing the dance of old Ukraine, the sound of his skin, half drum, half fart, the world at last a meadow, the three of us whirling and singing, the three of us screaming and falling, as if we were dying, as if we could never stop. In 1945, in Pittsburgh, beautiful, filthy Pittsburgh, home of the evil melons, 5,000 miles away from the other dancing in Poland and Germany. Oh, God of mercy, oh, wild God. It's a chilling poem. Yeah. I was interviewed by, God, I can't remember any names anymore. The, the guy who had been LBJ's press secretary and does- Bill Moyers. Bill Moyer. Uh, years ago, and he asked me to read that poem. He said, I love the poem. I don't understand the last line. Now, Bill Moore is a wonderful man, brilliant, and a religious guy. He was Methodist. He said, I don't understand. Why do you say wild God? I said, because God was away that day. He was on a picnic. He was eating a hoagie. He was eating potato salad. And he's scratching a bit. He's eating, but he didn't dig it. He did not, I mean, it's a very Jewish thing. God is very close and he's eating potatoes. <laughs> so maybe that's it, but I do find yeah, it But it's okay, I'm not being yeah. critical of Bill. No. I love Bill Moore. <laughs> okay, but, but, I, but I, that, I really appreciate you reading that poem because I think it does resonate for a lot of listeners. Um, I wonder if, since we don't have much time left, you'd tell us a little bit about, I guess, your life right now in the sense that you are a venerable figure in the poetry community. Oh my God, I'm venerable. Um, you're venerable, and therefore you're asked you mean to I'm do- I'm past 18? You're past 18. Oh, that lasts. I don't know if you want to tell us how old you are, but- 83. Okay, um, you don't look 83, but you are um, asked to do many things, to read, right. to write, to judge, uh, to take part in uh, all sorts of committees and foundations right, right, and endless things. Stuff. And I wonder, how do you choose? What do you like to do uh, now as a poet? I mean, I assume you still like to write. You're writing all I the write time. I write endlessly. Oh. I, like, I give readings and talks. I just was in Israel. I was in New Mexico. I was in Arizona. I was in California. I'm going to Boston. I'm going to Oaxaca, Mexico. I'm going to, to a lot of different places because so you, you're doing too much. I'd love to go to these places. So you want to just be in the world as yeah, well as I obviously. Yeah, I enjoy it. Write your I enjoy what I'm doing here. 
Well, I wondered if we could uh, talk about something you're writing now. Okay. You know, um, well, you, you this is my new write. manuscript here. Let me read one of these poems, a short one. Here's one about Pablo Casals, whom I had the joy and honor of hearing, breaking, hearing him play after his vow of silence in protest of the Spanish Civil War. In southern France, I was 22, 23 years old. And it took place in a church called St. Mary's. I wrote an essay about this. I'll just read the poem. Remember, Pablo Casals was five foot two inches tall. <laughs> you could either go back to the canary or you could listen to Bach's unaccompanied suites for which in both cases you would have the same sofa and you will be provided with a zigzag quilt to sleep under and a glass top table in great fury. For out of these three things music comes. Nor should you sleep if even the round muscles below the neck fall loose from their stringy moorings. For you would miss a sob and you would miss a melody a la red canary and a la white as well and a la canary perched as a cello was on top of a wooden box and a small musician perched on top of the cello and every night a church full of wild canaries. Nice There's the music that I was talking about earlier. What prompted you to write this poem now? Well, I guess I, I was lying down on my sofa that I described, listening to Bach's unaccompanied suites, which, which Casals had discovered by himself in a small, when he was 13 years old, in a back alley um, in uh, some small town in, uh, in Spain that had not yet been converted into, into uh, you know, uh, notes. And he did that. That's so interesting, though, where you tend to, I guess, take whatever situation you're whatever in. Whatever's there. And then you free associate often back in time or very far back in time. Yeah. Um, is, and that, would you say that is a, 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 fun, a, a, a characteristic of your it, style? It is. I think it's a characteristic of the artist. Of the artist. Yeah. To use the past and to try, well, I guess it's the... St. Mary's, I remember, I, I sat there for a week listening to him play. And in, in I say I went in with a with a journalist, and I said, and I, uh, they thought I was a journalist. I sat five feet away from him, six feet. But away. until you had this recent experience lying on the couch listening, had that been present to you? Well, I wrote about seven, eight years ago. I wrote an essay on because I was about that whole experience. But then that was just that, and I didn't re. I, I left it go and went into other things. I'm doing a lot of things simultaneously. Yeah. But um, I, I've enjoyed talking to you today. I love talking to you. Thanks thank so, you so much, much for coming. We've thank wanted you for, you for a long time. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel interview.